All right. So I'm going to try something that I haven't tried before. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of Zoom meetings before, but I haven't tried to do this before. Um, so, and I am doing this on my own personal Zoom and not my work Zoom. So before anybody questions that. So anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about New Orleans today because I get a lot of questions. If anyone's ever lived in New Orleans for any length of time or is from New Orleans or um, it, it considers New Orleans still their home, um, they get a lot of questions if you live in another part because New Orleans is a little bit mysterious and it's a completely different culture than the rest of the United States. But it's impossible to cover all of the history and all of the things about New Orleans that make it different. I would like to do a series of these, maybe one on different neighborhoods and how each neighborhood is a city or town itself um, and has everything you need right in a walkable distance to that neighborhood or maybe on the different cultures of the neighborhoods, um, maybe some local food places that you may not know about that um, tourists don't usually go or where to hear live music away from the tourism. Um, I'll probably like to cover everything except Bourbon Street, which is known for one thing, the city's completely different. And maybe talk a little bit about Mardi Gras and how many, like there's 70 something parades on Mardi Gras Day. And this one's a little bit related to Mardi Gras. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the um, Mardi Gras Indians. And this is something that a lot of people have a curiosity about, um, but a lot of people don't know much about them. So I'm going to show you a picture of a Mardi Gras Indian first. Um, let's see. So this is a Mardi Gras Indian. Um, and every part of a Mardi Gras Indian's costume has to be hand done by that person. So if you're in a Mardi Gras tribe and there's like around 40 Mardi Gras tribes um, that come together, and you have to design and make your own costume yourself. So that means everything from the stitching to the beading um, to the feathers or however you want to do your Mardi Gras costume, you have to do it yourself. Um, and they're very, very elaborate. And I'll show you a couple more in just a little bit. Um, so that's what the Mardi Gras Indians look like or, or just a one example um, of Mardi Gras Indians. But it's impossible to tell you the history of the Mardi Gras Indians until you hear um, a little bit about the neighborhood they came from. So as early as the 1700s, New Orleans really was founded, not founded, but the French discovered the area of New Orleans in the 1700s, or maybe it's now in the 1600s. And then the early 1700s, France um, took over and, and made it into a port city and a trading place, mostly for American Indians, and some foreigners that would come by river, um, but mostly for Native Americans. Um, so that tradition had started, and uh, so it was very common for Native Americans to come to New Orleans a lot. Um, New Orleans changed hands several times, of course, from France to Spain, back to France, and then finally to the United States later on, um, which has developed its own culture around that, um, around those changes, and a lot of influence from the Caribbean um, and from um, Africa. So anyway, there's a neighborhood in New Orleans called Treme, and Treme is credited with a lot of things. The number one thing it is, though, it is the oldest freed Black neighborhood in the United States, and it still exists, and it's still going strong. I'm going to talk about one thing they did to Treme that really hurt it. Um, but it existed in the 1700s um, and then grew through, a lot of it burned at one point, like a lot of New Orleans burned in the 1700s, the quarter burned in the 1700s. But during the 1700s, there was a wall around when New Orleans, the French Quarter was built originally by France. There was a wall around the quarter and inside the quarter, slavery existed. Outside of the quarter, there was a neighborhood called Trebe that was the a large freed black neighborhood. Now, this could be that somebody came to the country or was already here in the country and was not a slave. Um, some Creoles lived there as well of mixed race. Um, and then you could also, um, for the very lucky, and this is just horrible to go over some of this, but for the very lucky, you could purchase or work off a debt and then get out of slavery. And then you can move over 
to the free black neighborhood, which is Treme. Now, since there was a wall around the quarter at one time, which is now roughly around Rampart Street, is where the quarter ends and Treme begins. Um, Treme was a large neighborhood. It was a thriving neighborhood in the 1800s. Um, you'll hear some stories about Storyville that was located in Treme. Um, it's still a beautiful neighborhood, and I'll show you an example of some of the homes um, that are there now. Um, and it's still just a huge neighborhood. This is just one very, very small home, uh, a, a small piece of a street, basically. Um, let's see, let me find that. And you can kind of see the style of homes that are there. Now, this is this is not a pretty part of the street. <laughs> down on, uh, it goes all the way down to Esplanade and then all the way up to Canal Street. So there's some beautiful tree-lined streets. This one, if you'll notice, has a bridge over it, which is one of the things that I would have to cover if I'm going to cover Mardi Gras Indians and if I'm going to say anything about Treme. New Orleans is a strange place. This is what basically this bridge did to the neighborhood. Um, it divided the neighborhood. Um, in the 1950s, this bridge was built, an overpass bridge in New Orleans. And the funny thing about it is it didn't have to be built. Um, I'll show you a map of... Um, a little bit of New Orleans. This isn't all of New Orleans. But if you look on the map, you can see, okay, this is the French Quarter right here in that yellow right there. Marini's right here and Bywater's there, which are really cool neighborhoods too. Treme is this area right here. This is Rampart Street. Um, I'm hoping you can see my line, um, my little mouse cursor. Um, it comes down to Esplanade. It goes over to Broad Street, and then it comes up to Canal Street, which is right in this area. So it's a it was a pretty sizable neighborhood, and you can see the green that kind of goes right through it around Orleans Avenue. That's the Greenway, um, and that big square green is called Louis Armstrong Park now. And actually, what that used to be is Congo Square. And Congo Square was a place there was a wall around the quarter. Remember, right here. So Congo Square was a place that the freed blacks got together and every Sunday they danced and drum music and there were open markets and lots of business going on. They were very successful. It was a very successful neighborhood. Still is a thriving area of the city. And it's where many consider jazz to have been born because jazz was born out of that African-American Caribbean music um, and drum beat. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of jazz started right here for um, everyone. Um, anyway, on Sundays, a lot of the slave owners in the quarter, again, which was walled off, um, let their slaves have a Sunday where they could go and worship and then they could go to Congo Square and be with the freed persons of color. Now, to be a freed person of color, you could have moved to the United States maybe before slavery or after slavery, and were able to show papers that you were a freed person of color, or as horrible as all the sounds. I just I almost hate to talk about all this because it's so horrible, but it was a um, place where um, you could buy or work off a debt and become a free person of color. Uh, lots of Creoles in this area as well. Um, so they all would get together in Treme, in Congo Square. So I stopped sharing that. And what happened is that, the, and I'm getting to the Mardi Gras Indian part. <laughs> what happened is later on, and this happened in the 50s, New Orleans was trying to find um, a way to make traffic easier. And of course, this hits on institutional race, racism. It hurt the Black community in New Orleans because after slavery was over and after all Blacks were freed in New Orleans, which happened a year earlier than it happened in the United States. I think New Orleans was 1864. In the United States, it was 1865, I believe. 
don't quote me on those dates, but I have cousins and um and friends that will correct me if I'm wrong on some of these things, or historians that's correct me. But I think it was 1864 for New Orleans, 1865 for the United States, um, that all black persons were freed, slavery was old, over. Not the end of trouble, uh, you know, because there was Jim Crow, there were all these horrible things that happened after slavery. But this neighborhood began to really thrive at that point and was a, a business mecca um, during that time. And I'm going to show you what they did is they built a bridge, an overpass in the 1950s that split Treme in half. And so when it did that, if you can see my mouse, and I'm hoping you can, because I can't see it myself, or except a little glimpse of it up in the top corner. Um, Treme is this area right here, and I think I talked about the quarters right here. Um, this yellow line right here, not all the yellow lines are elevated highways, but this is the way you come into New Orleans, way up here. If you come from Baton Rouge, you're coming in this direction, and you can keep going straight across up here, miss the downtown part of New Orleans, and go out to New Orleans East and out to Slidell across the Lake Pontchartrain. Um, or you can cut down here, and this is elevated as well, and this one goes straight across the Mississippi, past New Orleans, and into, well, Algiers is New Orleans too, but right here on the West Bank, Algiers is here, lots of suburbs down in this area. So... Those are elevated. Uh, there's a couple more elevated, but none that cut through neighborhoods quite like this one did. This is not elevated. The one that goes around Bayou St. John, there's Tulane Avenue. Those aren't elevated. Those are big avenues, but they're not elevated. Um, this right here where it says I-10 is elevated, and this is what they built in the 50s. And if you'll notice, if you'll see the green square right there by the quarter, that's right across from Rampart Street. That's Louis Armstrong Park now. That was Congo Square in that area. There were also other, lots of other things there. The free markets, like I stated, and all these activities going on. Um, but on the other side of that, there's Claiborne going right through the middle of it, this elevated highway that is really ugly and all concrete. Um, under it is concrete. There's two streets that were the avenue that go down below it. So it's just a concrete para that goes right through the heart of Treme. So they split the black community in half. Um, so Treme is mostly in this area now and a little bit on this area, um, but they're on both sides and there's no place for them to meet and greet. This large avenue, and I think I've got a picture of what it used to look like. I will show you that um, right here. It's in black and white. But so this is what the neighborhood used to look like. Um, and you can see this big grassy area in the middle. There was a street over on this side and a street over on this side. And this grassy area is where people met um, and per persons of color met. And they had big celebrations there. They danced, they created music, they had art booths. They had all these things going on during here, especially on Sundays. Um, they would all get together. And it was a meeting place. It was a greeting place. It was a very supportive place to be. Um, so that's what the avenue used to look like. I showed you a little bit of a picture of what it um, what it turned into. And I hope I showed that well enough. Anyway, um, so I mean, I, I get lost. Again, this is not rehearsed. So, and I've got a French bulldog puppy that's like going nuts under my desk because I'm talking and she's not part of it. And here she is. So she had to understand that I'm doing this. So, okay. So Treme today is still a beautiful neighborhood. Um, I'm going to, she makes some odd sounds. So just be prepared for that. Um, this is a picture of Treme today. Um, Hoping you can see that. Um, beautiful home. Um, lining. There's trees. This is just a small little glimpse of a little piece of it. But just absolutely beautiful homes in Treme. So now to the Mardi Gras Indians part of this. So when there was slavery, the Mardi Gras Indians um, are, are the Indians, uh, uh, Native Americans, um, would trade with New Orleans 
that started in the 1700s and then going through slavery, um, the American Indians, and, and I keep calling them Americans, I should say Native Americans, Native Americans would come to New Orleans um, and um, trade with the um, white persons of New Orleans, the French and the Spanish mostly. Um, and then, you know, they had a canal by St. John was a big piece of that. And you might've heard of that. And I'm going to cover that in a future video. Um, they would come in, but what the Native Americans did for the African Black community, the African American community was um, they helped them. So they helped them escape. And one way that they helped them escape is they would, first of all, they would help smuggle them out. The other thing is, is when Mardi Gras came around each year, yes, and there was Mardi Gras way, way back when New Orleans was first founded, there was Mardi Gras. So what they would do is get elaborate headdresses, the Native Americans would, elaborate headdresses, and slaves could blend into that, and they would design these costumes for them, and they would pretend that they were Native Americans. And they helped them escape this way, or they just were able to get out and enjoy the rest of the city because they were dressed in Native American big costuming. So the Native American population helped the persons of color in New Orleans so much. Um, so the, um, the Mardi Gras Indian was born out of that. So it's a tradition that's continued since that time. There's around 40 tribes. And it, it, to give you kind of a flavor, Mardi Gras goes on for a month um, and it's Mardi Gras season and then it come, it culminates in Mardi Gras Day and then Ash Wednesday after. But there's about 70 parades in New Orleans that I'll talk about on another um, video. Um, but the Mardi Gras Indians come out on Mar just on Mardi Gras Day in full costume and they have, instead of fighting, they come against each other and they have dance-offs and all these tribal things that they do that's just the coolest thing you've ever seen. Um, so I'll show you a few pictures of the Mardi Gras Indians. Let's see. And some of the costumes and the elaborate costumes they have. So this is one picture, um, hopefully you can see this, <laughs> of some of the costumes. Um, and I'll show you another picture, hopefully. Um, here's another picture of what they look like. It's unbelievable that they do this. And they work all year making these costumes. So this is not like go out and buy a costume. These are all extremely intricate designs that both males and females make. Um, the chiefs are usually males, um, but the females will work on their own costumes. The males will work on their costumes. And the more elaborate you can get, the better. And it's kind of a contest of who can have the most elaborate costume. And this is all to honor the Native Americans that helped the Black community out um, during slavery times and after slavery times. After slavery times, Native Americans would trade with the free Blacks um, that were came out of slavery and would help them get on their feet financially, which, you know, in Treme, um, that neighborhood. So... The one other thing, I, I want to go back one time to the Claiborne Avenue Bridge, which cut Treme in half. Um, there were other choices of where to put this bridge. There's an easy route not even to have put any type of overpass um, there. This was made for the mostly um, Caucasian people in New Orleans, way out in New Orleans East and across the lake at Slidell. So they would have easy access to the quarter and to the downtown New Orleans area. There are a lot of other ways. It takes you maybe eight, eight minutes longer to get around and come in, or you can go down like they used to before the 1950s, go down onto that beautiful avenue that used to be there. Um, this is what the Claiborne Avenue Bridge looks like today. And then I'm going to tell you some of the plans that they have for it. So it's in horrible shape. It's falling down. Um, now, if you'll notice some of the posts all the way down, it's really cool. And this is fenced off right here for some reason. I'm not sure because it's not fenced off in many places under the bridge. But these um, columns have been painted by artists, by black artists mostly, 
um, and people still gather under the bridge now um, and congregate there because it's still a Sunday thing to do. Now it's done with cars everywhere <laughs> because they split the neighborhood. And also um, persons of color live all over the city. So now not just in Treme, but Treme is still traditionally a traditional um, African-American community. Um, and it's thriving and beautiful, beautiful place, um, especially as you get down to Esplanade and, and up to um, Louis Armstrong Park where Congo Square was and up toward Canal. Beautiful neighborhood on both sides of this bridge. Um, but this bridge is falling down. It's it's in really bad disrepair. And in the next 10 years, something would have to happen anyway. So they're either going to have to spend millions of dollars repairing it um, and make it safe. Um, it's still used today, um, so it's still holding up, but in the next 10 years, it won't be. There's already big pieces of concrete under it that are falling, um, so it's in really bad state, shape. One thing that the, the Biden administration and Democrats with bipartisan support did over the last two years was pass the infrastructure bill, and New Orleans got a big piece of that infrastructure bill, which is really cool because this is the project they're going to use. And New Orleans has already been doing all kinds of other improvements that are really cool that I'll talk about on another video of how to manage flood control. I mean, it's not just floodgates and, and um, pump stations. It's also wetlands inside the city that are turned into green spaces with containers under it. It's gorgeous. Um, so I'd show you some of those things, and that's to help prevent future floods. But this bridge... I think most of New Orleans, except for those way out in in Slidell and across the lake, who think of this as a little bit convenient to get to the city, even though it's just five to eight minutes difference if you didn't have it, they're the only ones I think they want to keep this. But New Orleans mayor, um, city council has stated this is exactly what the money will be used for. And I don't know if they'll tear it down or just take some of these over some of these ramps off of it that go into the neighborhood, which is horrible. Um, or I, I, my hope is they tear it all down. Um, they can have the avenue back. I'll tell you an ironic thing um, is the beautiful oak trees that used to line this avenue are now in Lake by Lakeside and Lakeview which is an all-white, very upper-middle-class neighborhood. So the same oak trees that they had here, they uprooted them in the 50s and actually planted them in the white neighborhood um, by the lake. So just the, one of the many, many injustices that um, the Black communities have had all over the country, it's just this one kind of stands out because you're talking about the oldest Black neighborhood in our country. Um, so a freed blacks. Um, so it's a it's a really important thing. But Mardi Gras Indians, I love what they do. I love how they honor the Native Americans this way. The Native Americans love what they do. Um, they're thanking them, and it's become such a tradition and on Mardi Gras Day. And they're they're sometimes hard to spot. You don't know where the Mardi Gras Indians are going to to pop up. Now, if you're under that under overpass now or in around Louis Armstrong Park or the old Congo Square and Mahia Jackson Theater in that area close to Rampart you're likely to see them you just don't know what time and they coincidentally meet up at different times there, there's no rhyme or reason to a time they're going to come out so different tribes come out at different times they have dance-offs no matter what color you are, um, it is a joy to watch. And it is so much fun. There's so much decoration on these costumes. Plus, the dancing is just unbelievable. And you can join in. Um, the Black community in New Orleans is extremely welcoming um, to anybody of any color, um, which I find just fantastic. And I wish more in white neighborhoods were like that. Um, anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful celebration. Something not to be missed. When you get caught up in all the tourism things of Mardi Gras or you're down on, Mar on Bourbon Street partying or if you're able to make it to some of the other neighborhoods in New Orleans, which have just unbelievable parades and parties themselves that aren't as raucous and some of them are more family oriented. I can tell you which ones are family and which ones aren't. We'll cover that on another one. I know I've gone long enough. I just want to talk a little bit about it. People always ask me questions about New Orleans. So if this goes over and, and if this works, I'll start doing this um, every chance I get, um, mostly on the weekends. But every chance it gets, I'll try to make a video.
So anyway, I hope everyone has an awesome Sunday um, and um, go visit New Orleans when you can. All right. Love you all. Bye.